Good evening. Welcome to our webinar, Fun with Food, a PEM nutritional, nutrition series. I am your moderator, Nicole. To begin our webinar, I would like to introduce Dr. Tetlow. Dr. Tetlow founded PEM or Philadelphia Integrative Medicine 12 years ago, where we offer patient care as well as teach and train others to offer integrative medicine care. PIM's vision is to empower, inspire change and trust with patients, PIM providers and staff, the functional medical community and ultimately the medical community at large. Dr. Tetlow maintains a patient care practice as well as a mentoring practice for clinicians in transition or maintaining phases of integrative and functional medicine here at our practice. And without further ado, Dr. Tetlow. Thank you so much, Nicole. And we're really excited to be with you tonight. We have gifts to share and we really want to share them. So our gifts are through this webinar tonight and they're also through our health clinic. Uh, we are different and we're different in how we operate and how we collaborate together as a provider team. And uh, your outcomes are different as well. Um, we hope that your outcomes are better and we are focused on your wellness. So sometimes people are told by a doctor, I really don't see anything in your labs or you know, maybe this is in your head. And at our practice, we seek to train other clinicians really how to use conventional testing to the fullest. So we won't be focusing as much on specialty testing tonight. We're gonna to be focusing on the foundation. I think you'll really enjoy this webinar tonight. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how you can get involved with next steps. We do have free consultations with Linda and Zoe. And then after you're in the practice, you can work with Caitlin and myself. And when you see one of us, you see all of us because we discuss your care every day. So without further ado, um, I will, um, let's get started. Thanks, Nicole. I'd like to invite a uh, warm, uh, uh, introduction and warm welcome to our provider, Linda. I don't know if you can see her on the screen or you'll see her soon. Uh, Linda has uh, an incredible combination of expertise as well as an extremely warm heart and one of the most skillful bedside manners that I have encountered among my colleagues and of clinicians. And uh, she has a distinguished uh, expertise from fellowship training, which is really most customarily uh, for physicians. She uh, went through as a nurse practitioner and completed a two-year fellowship at Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. She brings decades of experience and we are super glad to have her on our team. And she is my administrative partner at PIM. I lean on her all the time. So I'd like to introduce Linda Sherland. Thank you, Dr. Tetlow. I want to tell you just a little bit about PIM. If we could move the slide, Nicole. PIM is um, Philadelphia Integrative Medicine is really healing oriented medicine. We really address the whole person and think about all aspects of lifestyle. One of the things we're focusing on tonight is, is nutrition. So that's kind of one aspect of lifestyle. The other thing that's really key in integrative and functional medicine is the therapeutic relationship with your practitioner. As Dr. Tetlow said, you are a part of a team when you come and see us, but you will have that one-on-one -on -one relationship uh, with the practitioners that you see. And we believe that's key to, to healing. We are informed by evidence. Uh, we use uh, functional medicine testing, a wide variety of, uh, of tests. We use all appropriate therapies. Um, if we could have our next slide, Nicole. We treat all forms of chronic illness. We're also looking to, to expand your health. So you don't have to have a chronic illness to come see us. Some people come uh, just to uh, increase their health or to make sure that they're gonna have the best health for their life. As I said, we have functional testing. We also use conventional labs. We're completely telehealth practice right now, virtual visits. Uh, and these are eligible for insurance reimbursement. You're provided with a receipt that has all the proper codes. 
One way to access is uh, free consultations, and we're going to talk about those a little bit at the end of the talk. We'd also like to invite you to join our newsletter. Um, I'm sure when you signed up, register for the webinar, you were asked if you'd like to receive the newsletter, and we just invite you to do that. Now we're going to have a little bit of poll. Um, what we want to know. So um, Nicole's going to turn on the poll. We'll give you a few minutes to answer. We'd like to know if you've ever participated in a Philadelphia Integrative Medicine webinar before. Uh, we're wondering how you heard about our webinar. Did you find out in the newsletter, uh, maybe from one of us, your PIM providers? Maybe you saw it on Facebook or Instagram. Um, Integrative Therapeutics also sends out a, uh, an invitation. Or if there are other ways, you could just select other. And the third thing, we're just wondering, are you a, a patient at PIM? Are you a provider in the community or somewhere in the country? Or maybe you're both. We love seeing providers here um, as well as everyone else, but we do uh, see ourselves somewhat as uh, the providers to healthcare providers. Or maybe you're neither, neither of those and you're just here to learn. And we just wanna give you a warm welcome. So just take a few minutes. And Nicole, if you can just let, there we go. Okay, so about 57% have been in, um, been in a webinar before, that's great. So we're kind of half and half. 33% came from the newsletter and 29%, I guess we've done our job of sharing with you. Uh, 14 from social media, 14 from integrative therapeutics, and then 10% of you um, uh, found us through other ways. 57% tonight are patients and 38% are neither. So welcome. Um, whether you're someone who's not a patient or a provider and has never been or it's your first time, we're glad that you're here. Now I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce Zoe. Zoe, we're super excited for Zoe today. We just found out this morning that Zoe is now the Integrative Functional Medicine Certified Practitioner. She got the news at 7.15 last night. Uh, Zoe is a physician assistant. She has completed two uh, functional medicine programs this year and is now certified um, in functional medicine and soon will be double certified in the School of Applied Functional Medicine as well. So I'd like to welcome Zoe and um, just really Zoe, congratulations on this wonderful um, achievement. Thank you so much, Linda. That's so kind of you. I feel really honored tonight to be introducing the woman of the hour, Caitlin Self. Caitlin is a functional and integrative nutritionist, and she obtained her master's of human nutrition from the Maryland University of Integrative Health. She's also sourced her education from Apex Functional Endocrinology and Mastering Functional Blood Chemistry, as well as the SIBO Academy training and GI Dietitians Roadmap and PCOS Nutrition Center. I think what I love most about Caitlin is her root cause mindset and her team-based approach. I love our morning provider meetings where we have an opportunity to discuss patient care. When questions arise, Caitlin dives right in to offer very key insight with a special emphasis on food. Her devotion to her patients is certainly evident and it really is a privilege to serve patients alongside of her. So without further ado, here is Caitlin, our main presenter tonight. Hi everyone, thank you Zoe so much for that great introduction and to everyone for kicking things off for us this evening. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I am the newest provider at PIM and I have had such a warm welcome. I love the collaboration that's available and I really love how they truly are looking at all aspects, not just nutrients or supplements, but also looking at food and looking at lifestyle and looking at how all of these things uh, kind of mesh together. Sometimes in functional medicine, we forget about having fun with food. We really just start 
focusing on kind of looking at what the root cause is and figuring out how we can fix it. But sometimes we need to remember the humanity behind that. And sometimes that involves having fun. So um, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what having fun with food means to you and, and to all of us and um, kind of come up with some other ideas as well. Um, here I have some examples from when I actually used to work at a preschool and uh, we did these fun little cooking classes. And so this is one example of maybe having fun with food. Is it kind of uh, being a toddler playing with your food? Or if you have other ways where you sort of um, interact with food. And we're gonna take a look at the next slide here also, which has three images. Um, on the left, we have a new vegetable. This is a broccoli Romanesco. In the middle, we have a cupcake, which is maybe sort of a fun food to you. And then on the right, we have a variety of spices. So it's important to identify that there are different ways to have fun with food. Maybe your version is incorporating new flavors, new vegetables, or maybe your version is baking with your kids or enjoying fun foods that maybe are higher in sugar or they're kind of on on sort of the less frequent list. So one of the ways that we can really start to identify, you know, how we can have fun with food is to really tune into your own hunger and fullness. So when we ignore our signals of hunger and fullness, it's hard to relax around food or have any kind of fun with it. And we often have a hard time enjoying things like baking muffins with our kids or trying out a new restaurant if we aren't comfortable with our own feelings of hunger and fullness and, you know, trusting our body to tell us when it's hungry and trusting our body to tell us when it's full. So to kick things off this evening before we launch into the bulk of the presentation, I thought we would do what I call a hunger body scan. And this is a way to tune in with the different parts of your body and, and energy and mentality to see if you're experiencing hunger in a way that's different from your traditional growling stomach. So I'm just gonna pass the mic to Dr. Tetlow for a moment here. And uh, it's gonna be a brief change from our standard meditation, but she's gonna take it away. Thanks, Caitlin. And um, I think this is a perfect way for us to do a little introspective moment. And this will take about five minutes. Uh, I do invite you to get comfortable and to turn your attention inward. And if it feels right to close your eyes and you're able to do a version of this uh, in a much shorter period of time. And you can call on it on different times of the day just to see um, what you experience and what you notice and what you learn as you're connecting with your body. So let's get started and taking a breath, briefly scanning your body, just starting with your head and moving through your body, through your trunk, your torso downward all the way to your toes. Just seeing what you notice. Is it pleasant, unpleasant? neutral, see what fits, or words to describe, or words to fit your experience. We'll look at some key areas, and we're going to focus on mood first. So sometimes we're experiencing hunger and how we feel. For example, we can get irritable or cranky. Sometimes it can be hard to be uh, positive. These can be signs that we're experiencing some hunger. Just notice what your mood is. This is a little assessment related to your body. Shifting attention then to your energy level. Just noticing if your energy is high, medium, or low right now. So sometimes hunger can feel like we're a little sluggish or like we need some rest or just blah. Just noticing if you experience hunger as um, a level of energy. Then finally, feeling sensations in your body. I know for myself, sometimes I experience hunger in uh, sensations I feel in my head. Like I can feel a little lightheaded or a little dizzy, a little faint, maybe even a slight headache. Sometimes it can be hard to concentrate and sometimes that's my cue 
that I'm actually hungry. So just noticing sensations. And not just in your head, but also feeling your stomach. Sometimes our stomach can feel empty. So scanning, noticing. Do you feel any pain or pressure in your stomach? Any rawness or gnawing? Do you have hunger pains or maybe just neutral? Other sensations can be just noticing that when you think about food or hunger, you might salivate or maybe even feel shaky or uncomfortable. And some people quiver when they feel hungry. So taking into all these aspects of mood, energy level, sensations, just give yourself a rating on your overall hunger for right now. If you're scoring yourself on a scale of zero to 10. So 10 is very hungry. Just see where you are right now. Give yourself a number. So the more able, we're, more we are able to practice this and to rate our hunger and hunger and, and check with our body and communicate with our body, uh, receiving that communication uh, can be really helpful as a foundation. So we try this scan. If you wanna, uh, we recommend you try it at least once a day as PIM providers, and it's something that also might come up in an appointment with Caitlin. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Tetlow. I really do that frequently in appointments and sometimes I'll do it before, you know, I'll ask before we start, what kind of hunger you think that you're feeling and then we'll do it and uh, we'll find that we actually were able to identify some hunger. Some, some people's hunger just shows up as a headache and it doesn't really show up in their stomachs. I uh, have a a client who has never really felt true stomach hunger as far as she can recall, and she just gets very sleepy. And that's when she knows she's hungry. So we sometimes need to tune into that. We The body is always sending us messages, and sometimes we just have to pay attention and know how to hear them and know how to translate them. So this is sort of an example of... Um, hunger uh, and hunger on the hunger and fullness scale. We spend a lot of time talking about fullness and you know eating just until you're 80% full and making sure we don't overeat. But I find that we don't pay enough attention to hunger. We will often go too long without eating because we've kind of artificially suppressed our hunger due to coffee or stimulant use or chronic stress, or even chronic dieting can be a way that we artificially suppress our hunger. So what I've listed out here are one through six on the hunger scale. It goes all the way to 10, but I really just wanted to talk about these because they encompass hunger. And when we're in those first three stages where we have any type of intense hunger, or perhaps we are getting irritable, or maybe we're just very hungry, but not ravenous. Usually when we've dipped into that level of hunger, we've actually gotten to a point where we have lower blood sugar and we're triggering something that we refer to as biological hunger or primal hunger. And when we get into that level, we have less control over food cravings and food decision-making because the body is actually seeking energy and calories. And so, um, you know, you'll see that four to six range when you're maybe hungry and ready to eat or having some subtle hunger or neutral. Those are, those are safe places to be. But when we dip down into kind of that hanger stage, that's that irritability from low blood sugar. So um, typically, a lot of, well, not typically, but I will say we are often experiencing hunger and binging actually as a result of not eating enough food. So while processed food is probably the biggest issue around food, and we'll talk about that a little bit today, and I think many of us can agree on that, you know, the culture we have of skipping meals and dieting and trying to eat as little as possible under the facade of health is often a close second. So if you find that you're binging on fun or junk food, it may simply just be because you're over hungry. I like to say, don't show up to a cupcake when you're in that primal hunger stage. Don't show up to a cupcake when you already have low blood sugar. You'll end up eating it too fast. You won't enjoy it and you won't feel satisfied. You'll still feel hungry. 
Um, Nicole, if you could just progress the slide, um, that's kind of what I just shared with everyone, but we're actually going to dive into uh, the just one more poll, one more Zoom poll here, and I'd like you to reflect, how does this statement make you feel? So the statement is, your daily food choices can promote health or promote disease. So we've got four options here, and it could be other. I, we just don't have an other button. But does it make you feel empowered, like your health is in your hands? Does it make you feel kind of disappointed that you can't just eat freely? Does it make you feel overwhelmed about how to know what's right for you? Or does it make you feel ashamed or guilty, like if you do have poor, you know, health outcomes or poor health or, you know, blood work that you have to work on? Do you feel like, oh, I only have myself to blame for my poor health? So we'll just take a moment to get through this and then we'll go over kind of what we're what we're seeing. All right, so I've got 35% uh, said empowered, like your health is in your hands. Three or 18%, sorry, say disappointed, like you'd rather just be able to eat freely. 29% said overwhelmed, how do I know what's right for me? And then 18% said ashamed or guilty. So to me, that's close to 40% saying they feel some sort of disappointment or guilt uh, from, this, from this statement. And then another 30% say overwhelmed, 35% feel empowered. So really only a third of us feel empowered by that. I think that's important to kind of acknowledge. Um, if you look at the next slide here, functional nutrition is really important. You know, um, I'd love for that statement to help you feel empowered, but I know that sometimes, you know, it doesn't feel empowering. It does feel overwhelming. Food can be incredibly healing and it's the foundation of health. We need these nutrients. Food and nutrition can reverse chronic disease and improve your quality of life, but sometimes we take it too far. Food isn't only for health and well being of the physical body. While it can be a very important piece, sometimes we, we go too far and we really start dipping into sort of these like judgments, judgments against ourselves and against others for food choices. And as, uh, as many social scientists like to say, we don't really find success if we try to get there through shame. And I'd like you to think that for yourself as well. You're probably not going to find success if you take the shame boat to get there. So trying to pay attention to that and see what you can, what you can do to maybe reframe some of that. So here on this next slide, um, we've got this example of this poor person here who just really does not feel like he can eat those foods. That's a good example, I think, because sometimes when we overfocus on this healthfulness of food and we start using moralistic terms like good versus bad, it can damage our relationship to food. And that's a relationship that we have forever. If you think about how many meals we have in a day, typically three, that's 21 meals in a week. That's somewhere around a thousand meals in a year. A thousand times over the course of the year, you're gonna pass judgment on yourself for food choices that you made. And we all do it, it's, it's not your fault. There are many things that factor into this, but I'd like to just reflect on that, whether you're here as a patient or a provider or just to learn. But when we say things are good and bad, those are moralistic terms. And even if we don't mean them in those pure moralistic terms, words do carry meaning. And so when we overfocus on food as fuel or as disease prevention, we can really make those 1,000 meals over the course of the year, really anxiety provoking. And that in and of itself, we know is not really the, the path to health and wellness. So just kind of keeping that in mind, and then maybe sitting for a moment to forgive yourself. The messaging can make us feel guilty, like maybe we're responsible for our health ailments, and therefore we're also to blame. And so we may have internalized that. If you've ever told yourself you were bad or wrong for eating something that wasn't perfect for your health, sometimes we just need to take a moment to forgive ourselves. Forgive ourselves for maybe consuming something that hurt us, but really forgiving ourselves for the judgment and acknowledging that treating ourselves with humanity and with loving kindness 
moving forward with food as much as we can is going to put you on a much healthier path in terms of your relationship to food, which again is a lifelong relationship. So I've got these three categories here on this next slide. And I'd like you to just kind of ask yourself, what do you think of food as? Do you think of food as fuel? Like, you know, calories in, calories out, the pure physics of it. And uh, as some people say, if it fits your macros, then you can eat it regardless of the quality. Do you think of it as disease prevention and treatment where maybe you focus on super clean eating? Or do you think of it as enjoyment where maybe you're just eating for flavor and personal preferences? And that's typically what we see on the standard American diet where we have a lot of processed foods. I think some people will look at this and they'll say, oh, well, there's a clear right answer of how we're meant to think about food. But whatever you think that may be, I'd like to kind of question it. You know, we don't have, we don't want to get too stuck on all of this black and white. We want to embrace the gray, embrace the gray area between these different dichotomies. So really, it's not just one of these three. If we look at the next slide, we'll see it's really all three living in that gray area. So regardless of how you may perceive it, maybe you think, oh, number two is the way to go. Clean eating, disease prevention, treatment. You're still eating it for fuel and you're still either gaining or losing some level of enjoyment. All three of these things are at play. So just trying to kind of see if you can shift your mindset just a little bit as practitioners, the language that we use around food and as patients, the language that we use around food for ourselves and our loved ones and people in our home. You know, nobody likes to be judged for what's on their plate. And you, as an individual, we don't really like to either, but sometimes it's us judging ourselves. So just kind of um, giving yourself a little bit of breathing room there, a little bit of space, a little bit of humanity and kindness when it comes to our food choices can be a really good jumping off point. So we're gonna get into these three things, fuel, disease prevention or treatment and enjoyment, because I think it's important to pay attention to what these are and how important all of them really are. So this first one here, using food as fuel. So if we wanna be really straightforward with it on the next slide, we've got some examples. Using food as fuel, that's simple. We gotta make sure we're eating enough food. Going back to that hunger scan, making sure that you're tuning in and you're not accidentally under eating because you just drink four cups of coffee or because you're, you're maybe trying to intermittent fast and, and maybe doing it on your own. Uh, a lot of times when that happens, you end up just actually under eating. Drinking enough water is important. These are the things that are essential to our survival. And then making sure that you're getting adequate fat, fiber, protein, and carbohydrates to fit your body and your lifestyle. So that may not be the same as the person sitting next to you or sitting across the table from you. And that's, that's one of the benefits of working with a team or with a provider is that you can really kind of you know, hone in on some of these things that are going to suit you on an individual level. And then finally, it's important just to note that the food is safe for you. So, you know, it's been handled properly. The food security is there for you. You have access to food and, and also taking into consideration any allergies or sensitivities or eating disorders and, and things like that, really individualizing it. So I like to sort of just take a quick step back and think about the basic tenets of nutrition. So again, even if we're trying to, you know, have fun with food or make peace with food, we still need to eat food that supports our lives, no matter, no matter how much we try to have, you know, a more relaxed attitude around food. You can't build a house without the foundation. That's one of the foundations of functional medicine is working with food and nutrition, because we know that that is sort of how you build that framework. And this is especially important in times of healing and sickness, uh, post-surgery periods of growth and development, but really it's important all the time. It's helpful all the time. So eating, eating as much real food as you can, eating plenty of fruits and vegetables and grains and beans, things in these categories that you can actually tolerate. So, so you know, making sure that you're not eating things that are quote good for you, but aren't actually good for you as an individual. I uh, use the example of avocado a lot. We love avocado. Avocado is a great healthy fat with plenty of fiber. 
Avocado also is high in histamine. Some people react to histamine. Some people can't tolerate avocados. They're also kind of high in FODMAPs. And there are some people who can't tolerate that at all. And they cause really bad symptoms. So one food that, you know, we may even in the media world think is super, super healthy and good for us in general, there's still gonna be some people who can't tolerate it that well. So keeping that in mind, you really wanna make sure that you're choosing the things that work for you and not just what uh, someone shared on Instagram that was working for them. And then again, eating enough food, but not necessarily too much food. So identifying and honoring hunger and fullness. So these are sort of the basics. Then we get into kind of more specifics, using food therapeutically. This is important. We've got plenty of conditions and diseases that, that really benefit from nutrition and dietary changes. So I think of therapeutic use as adding on to those basic tenets of nutrition working with a skilled provider to make sure you're personalizing it. And then you start by sort of adding in these different therapeutic foods. So there are some examples there. If you'd like to look at them, you know, the common ones that we hear is like um, maybe eating some, some liver if you have an iron deficiency or perhaps eating fermented foods for your healthy microbiome. Um, I know that Zoe has something great that she often shares with uh, her patients on this topic. I'm going to pass the mic to her real quick. If you want to jump in on that, Zoe. Absolutely. And, you know, to kind of add to your point, I just love the idea that food is information and it's like an instruction manual for the body and our food tells our body how to run. And through our daily food choices, we have the power to actually change that input, the information that we present to our body. And most importantly, the output, the way our body performs. And that could, as you mentioned, could result in numerous downstream effects, more energy, less inflammation, the list goes on and on. So I think that's really powerful. Awesome. Thanks so much, Zoe. Um, I also want to point out here on this second slide with the, with the green text is that when we're using food therapeutically, we first want to try, if possible, and everyone's going to be different, but when we can, to add in the therapeutic foods first to really support healing and remove the trigger food second. In most cases, this is the appropriate order. In some situations, like with celiac, removing gluten is probably more important than adding in your polyphenols and phytonutrients right, right off the bat, off the bat or removing an allergy. But these are some other examples of things that you may want to try to remove when we are using food therapeutically. The reason I bring this up is because we're always so quick to just start taking things away. I think we just really have this, this idea that food is the root cause of all of our problems and therefore the root cause of all of our solutions. And while to some degree that may be true, you know, you can use food as medicine and use medicine medicine uh, or really use um, your food as medicine, but we want to really boost your nutrition, boost your fiber, boost your colors, boost all of these things that are going to be supportive more than we want to just start taking things away. Because if we start taking away all your favorite foods, you may not know what to eat and where to start. And then you layer on all these different diets and then you look at all these different lists. And finally, you only have seven foods that you're supposed to eat. No, we never really want to get anyone to that point. So trying to start with sort of adding in the therapeutic foods and then removing the trigger foods second, if we can. So um, one of the last things kind of on this category is that I just like to remind all of us that um, while it is helpful to think about food choices we make as supporting health or promoting disease for some of us, sometimes it is harmful and can cause undue stress, can cause that stressful relationship to food, that push pull where we feel like every single food choice has to be perfect for our exact situation. And I've actually had many patients come to me with eating disorders after a diagnosis of something like diabetes or heart disease. So you're really just trading one disease for another. You're not actually curing yourself or your patients by doing that. We have to remember that doing no harm is just as important as doing some type of healing. So trying to keep that in mind can be really, really helpful with the language again that we use for ourselves and with our patients. All right, so let's move right into this third category here, using food as fun or love or enjoyment. I think uh, we can all 
sort of gather around on this topic where we sometimes do like to use fun for enjoyment in various ways. It could just be, you know, in a loving community environment. It can be in a holiday, it can be with nostalgia and comfort. I think a lot of times we get really negative about the emotions around food. And I think we, we don't need to be quite so negative around it. There's nothing wrong with having emotions around food or even having some amount of emotional eating. What we like to say is we don't want food to be your main coping mechanism by any means, but that doesn't mean that you can't feel joy when someone brings you, you know, homemade biscuits or when someone you or when you go home and visit family members and you smell the same smell that you've been smelling every time you see your grandma when she's making sauce or something like that. So just having that peace and, and safety around food and also acknowledging that a lot of love goes into food sometimes. I like to remind people, think about when you go to a bakery and you just think, oh, you're just buying, you're just buying this croissant because it looks good or because you're having a bad day. Even just taking a moment to remember there is someone who loved baking so much that they wanted to open up a shop to share that love with the community. And that love is in every single thing that they serve. So it can sometimes just be helpful to have that sort of more universal thought process around these things rather than over-focusing on the individual and how this one thing is going to interact with me and my body. That is something that you can leave up to a certain degree to your practitioners to help you figure out, but we don't want that to kind of chase you around too much with all of your decisions. Um, and again, being very clear that specific allergies and sensitivities are maybe a little bit outside of that specific thing. So I like to use this example here of uh, these classic chewy chocolate chip cookies. That is a delicious cookie. That's uh, a picture that I took at some point. And let's break it down. I mean, I'm a nutritionist. I'm highly trained in this. It is high in sugar. That's inflammatory. We know that's not great for your blood sugar. They contain gluten, which is a big problem for many, many people. Lots of butter, which does not go well with a lot of people who especially have dairy sensitivities. All-purpose flour has almost no nutritional value. And, you know, it might not always make you feel your best when you're eating cookies. But then if we try to look at some of the pros here, we can think, well, it's delicious. I mean, it tastes really good. And is there more to the cookie than just what's in front of you? For me, cookies really strongly remind me of my family. My mother always baked chocolate chip cookies for us. And it was one of the first things that I remember learning to cook. And I have three siblings and the four of us would bake chocolate chip cookies by ourselves and make a huge mess all over the kitchen. And we, it was one of the things we were allowed to do and we got to have cookies at the end. So that memory still lives with me and these types of cookies. And you know, I feel confident at making them and I think it's therapeutic. I love watching the sugar cream together with the butter if I'm, if that's what I'm making. So sometimes it's just a matter of reframing and really thinking about the things that are kind of getting in the way of us being able to use food as fun or enjoyment or as love. Um, I'm not going to read this whole next slide here, but I do think that just diet culture restriction social media messaging, these are all factors that really play a role in how we interact with food and how we get some of these food fears. You know, um, when foods are processed to be more craveable, they're more successful at triggering those cravings and that dopamine release. So if you selected that ashamed or guilty answer, or even that overwhelmed or disappointed answer, look at, look at how many things that are kind of working against you here. It's not your fault if you're in poor health, even if your health issues are nutritional, but you do have the ability to make some of these changes. You do have the, the power to put some of your health in your hands. And I'm not saying all of your health is in the hands of, you know, this, this nutrition necessarily, but we do have some agency. And Really, if you're working with the right people, if you have the right support system and you have the right team, you can learn for yourself kind of the basics of nutrition as we sort of discussed here. And then you can start to look inward and intuit what foods are serving you best. If we bring mindfulness into our eating practices, we can tune into what our bodies really need. An example I like to use here is lactose intolerance. 
Lactose intolerance almost all the time is gonna be what we call a clinical diagnosis. And what that means is the clinician is relying on what's in front of them, the person, to, to have signs or symptoms. And with lactose intolerance, everything is internal. So you, as the patient, have to have the symptoms. You have to notice and report the symptoms to your clinician. These are things that are felt and experienced by you. We do have a breath test for this, but we rarely use it. And so usually the diagnosis is really relying on the patient to actually be paying attention to their own symptoms. And it's that type of intuiting, that intuition that we're looking to help you sort of harness. And, I, and so you can identify. You know, we have people coming in all the time who are starting to identify maybe foods that make them feel great or foods that aren't making them feel so great. Try drinking the amount of water that you're supposed to drink in a day and see how much better that can make you feel in a single day. So with all of those things in mind, I like to present this next slide here with um, sort of the ingredients of my favorite chocolate chip cookies. I don't make them all the time. I also don't crave them all the time. You know, for me, I have come up with, I have this great recipe that's adapted from, um, from the Serious Eats website. I make them gluten-free. Uh, sometimes I make them dairy free for people as needed on occasion. I might reduce the sugar a little bit, but I like to think about the other ways that we can make these things healthier, like preparing them with love, enjoying it when you're nourished, not famished. Remember, don't show up to this. Don't show up to a cookie or a cupcake when you're in that primal hunger, and then eating with some of that joy, compassion, and mindfulness and sharing with friends and family. I don't know if I've ever made a batch of chocolate chip cookies that I haven't shared with someone because all the love that goes into that, I just want to share it. I want to walk over to my friend's house and bring her some cookies. I want to wrap them up really well and mail them to my sister across the country. And, and that really, that community piece of it is really helpful and important. Now, moving on to another way of using food as fun, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about some food memories, but we're also gonna talk about this other way of using food as fun. Now, if you saw, remember you saw earlier those, uh, those pictures of the bananas that were shaped like dolphins and had the little grape in their mouths, that can be a way to use food as fun. I definitely use that with adults who are selective eaters. But playing with your food is a great way to feel safe and comfortable around it. But maybe you just want to try a new food or cuisine, try some new spices, try something that's kind of funky to you um, and get outside your comfort zone. Maybe that means you are trying a Moroccan dish tonight or you're going to order a sun basket meal kit so that you can kind of cook that and try something that you maybe otherwise would never pick out of a cookbook or at the grocery store. So um, we are going to transition to talking a little bit about our memories around food and these emotional pieces that come to mind. So I'd like to pass it off to Linda. She's going to cover some of this for us. Thanks so much, Caitlin. This has just been so wonderful. I love the thought of bringing love in with food. That's, that's something that's important to me. So what I'd like for you to do, if you would just join me and close your eyes. And I want you to think of a happy memory that has to do with food. Just maybe take a couple of breaths in, let yourself settle in the chair, let your shoulders relax. And let that memory come in. Where are you? And who are you with? Some of our happiest memories involve food. Maybe it's getting ice cream with your Nana when you were maybe five. Ooh, maybe you snuck a little piece of food off your dad's cutting board um, when they were carving the turkey. As this memory comes through, does it change your mood at all? And now we're gonna take a few minutes just to share some of our food memories. And so just be with your own memory and, um, and we'll go ahead, Nicole, and show the team. And we're gonna, we're gonna share our food memories with you. What came, up, what came up for you, Caitlin, as you were thinking about your food memory? So um, I just love doing this exercise because different things come up whenever I do it. 
And I actually had a different memory to share and a new one just popped up and I'm going to share that one instead. So, you know, like I said, I had three siblings and when you're in a household of six people, you don't get a lot of control over what's put on the table. You know, you eat what's served. And I have such a strong memory that popped up when I was in middle school and I was on the swim team and my mom would take me to these swim meets. And at the end of those swim meets, because we were driving 30, 40 minutes, an hour away, she would let me pick whatever and wherever I wanted to eat. And I have such a strong, it's like a visceral memory of smelling like chlorine, being a little bit wet, sitting in the booth of a Chili's, eating a Caesar salad, which for some reason as a child, I loved Caesar salad with crispy chicken on top. And it's funny thing because I remember when I went off to college, that was what I would order when I would be in my, in my, you know, in my cafeteria or out to eat, I would often order Caesar salad with that crispy chicken on top. And in reflecting on that now, I know that's because I wanted a little bit of a hug from my mom, a little bit of love, a little bit of attention um, when I was kind of out a little fish in this big, big ocean in this big college that I went to. So that's a food memory I wanted to share. Um, I think Zoe, you were going to go next. Yes, I have a very similar memory uh, to you, Caitlin. I think back to uh, some of my cross-country meets and track meets. And uh, my mom and dad, they would often come whenever they could. And if my mom were to come, she would always bring uh, a whole cooler full of fresh cut up fruit and also uh, veggies. And although it was quite simple, I just loved it. And my friends would too. And I'd grab all my friends and tell them that, um, you know, my mom had brought some fresh fruit and we would just talk. It would be after the race. We all felt we were sweaty and tired, but accomplished and just really enjoying this fresh food. So that's um, one food memory that I have that really um, makes me feel quite happy when I think back on it. So I'll go ahead and share my memory. Um, I was raised in a farm family. We were rice farmers. And in August was when we harvested the rice. And, and as little kids, we would go and work out in the field. And we worked hard. We worked from early in the morning till dark at night. And so we would eat lunch together. We, our moms would make our lunch and we would uh, eat lunch. But in the afternoon, about three o'clock, and so we're in these big fields with dirt roads and around three o'clock in the afternoon, we'd start looking. We were driving giant tractors, way bigger than we should have been on. And, but we'd start looking and all of a sudden we'd look down the road and here would be this cloud of dust coming. And we'd say, it's the booty roll wagon, it's the booty roll wagon. It didn't matter what was in the car, it was always the booty roll wagon. My uncle named it that. And one of my favorite things would be, and, and the moms, my grandma, my aunts, my mom took turns every day bringing a snack to the field. But one of my favorites was my grandma would pull up and she had one of those giant, you know, four doors with the big trunk and she'd open the trunk and we just couldn't wait. And the best day was when she would make homemade jelly roll. And when she would raise the trunk, you could smell the jelly roll and it was beautiful and it was, you know, dusted with powdered sugar and it was this gorgeous sponge cake with homemade jelly that she had made. And then she would make for us grape juice and lemonade punch. And three o'clock in August in Texas, out in the middle of the field when we were dusty and sweaty and nasty and we'd go sit under the grain trucks where it was shady and we would have our... Uh, jelly roll, which was a pretty chic snack, I thought, in the middle of Cypress, Texas, out in the middle of a rice field with our uh, grape juice and lemonade punch. And then that way we would go back to work, make it through till night till we could get home and kind of fall asleep in our plates at dinner. We'd be so tired. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Um, I will share a food memory for me, and uh, what uh, comes to mind is I remember when I went to college, I went to Haverford College, and I remember when I first went to the dining hall, and I was trying to get my bearings and figure out where I was going to sit, and I remember feeling like there was nothing to eat there, and um, 
I had actually lived at a yoga center for a year before I went to college. So I was trying to eat like I was at the yoga center. So I was like being a vegetarian in this college cafeteria, which didn't have anything for vegetarians. It was like pasta and red sauce. So what I did was I became part of a, a group of people that would cook for each other. And so Haverford is part of a bi-college community with Bryn Mawr. So those of you who aren't local, I know we have 90 people registered for the webinar. Some will be watching tonight and some will be catching it later on the replay. So Haverford and Bryn Mawr are local colleges here uh, on the main line, uh, just west of Philly. And so I remember going to this uh, group for, for cooking. And I remember being so intimidated, you know, like someone made a Thai curry. I was like, oh boy, you know, what am I going to do when it's my turn, you know? And uh, I remember the pleasantness, you know, we're supposed to come up with a memory that was enjoyment with food. My enjoyment was when I did not burn what I was cooking. And I was just so <laughs> relieved when I had finished, like, for preparing the food, there was enough for everyone and it was done. It was just like the sense of relief because it was like this social time and it was great to connect with everyone, but I really felt this sense of, you know, I have to do this well. And like, people will go hungry if I, if I don't get this together. So I had, we had comfort food sometimes, we had Indian meals and um, it was just a, it was a, uh, I eventually began to enjoy it more, but I can remember my, how scared I was and then how relieved I was. I love that. I love all of those memories. Thank you everyone for sharing. I actually think it's good that you brought up, sometimes they're not always super happy. I, for some reason, when I studied in college, I drank grape juice. And to this day, I can't stand the smell of grape juice because it just reminds me of studying late into the night. So we have a lot of emotions that come up around food. And one thing that I'd like to actually point out here is that if you take a moment to try to conjure up a memory of food or try to conjure up uh, some sort of food craving. Sometimes you have to think a step further to identify what you actually need. So if what I was craving in college, for example, was that Caesar salad and that, that you know, crispy chicken, maybe I needed to call my mom. Maybe I needed a little bit of, of love from my home. And sometimes just tuning into that can help us to identify, you know, are we having these food cravings and some of these like binging habits, for example, simply because we're not giving ourselves the self-care that we actually need, whether that's stress relief or community or, you know, love and support. Sometimes that's, that's all we need, or maybe we just need to take a nap. That's also an option, right? Um, so I think it's helpful to kind of remember that there's a lot going on in, in there with these memories and with our interactions with food. Um, the next thing that uh, we're all going to do is actually share one of the ways that we have fun with food. So um, we showed some pictures before of different things that you can do to have fun with food. I just wanted to share about the chocolate chip cookies, which is you've seen a little bit of that already. And um, I did want to note that you will get these recipes. I know sometimes people are like, why are you telling me about this if I can't make it myself? You're going to get the recipes in the email that comes to you tomorrow. But uh, one of the recipes that I really like is making nut butter chocolate chip cookies. They're really easy to put together. So so they, they don't take a lot of ingredients. They're very simple. They're really hard to mess up. Um, I actually, you know, love it that my little cousins all make them. They're like, I can't bake at all, but they can make these. And what I like about them is that they give me a lot of the, maybe that comfort or that chocolatiness that I'm looking for, but you know, they're higher in protein. And so I'm going to be able to get the soothing things that I'm looking for but I'm also gonna be getting some actual nutrition from it, which I do appreciate when that can really be sort of married into one piece. Um, so I really like making those nut butter chocolate chip cookies and you can, you can add different types of chocolate. I sometimes like to get those, uh, those unreal dark chocolate gems. They're like these dark chocolate M&M type of things that can be fun with them and like to make them you know, with my nephew and things like that, they can be really fun. Thanks so much, Caitlin. I think about a recipe that I um, really enjoy. It's actually a coconut curry chicken. My husband and I like to make this at least once a week. Um, it's certainly a favorite. And what I love about it is it's quick and it's super tasty. And certainly by the end of the evening, after a long day, uh, one thing I really enjoy is a quick dinner. So um, this you know, involves some chicken, uh, jasmine rice, 
full fat coconut milk and some frozen veggies that we can quickly put into a pan and fry up and some curry powder. I like it because it's quick, it's delicious, it's healthy, there's lots of fiber and uh, I also feel really good after I eat it. And I think that's really important for me is how do I feel when I eat food? And when I eat this meal, I know that I'm always gonna feel good afterwards. I'm not going to crash. I'm not gonna feel bloated. I'm not gonna feel tired, but I'm gonna feel, I'm gonna feel good. So that's one of my favorite meals. When I think about cooking, I love cooking for people. And when you were talking tonight, Caitlin, about cooking with love and bringing that, cooking beautiful foods, that's important. You had mentioned dopamine and how these processed foods are really uh, kind of trigger our dopamine and that can become addictive. And what I've also learned that if we really want that dopamine, bringing in color, I like, like you see right behind me, I love color. And I have this, this wall hanging behind me, but I love to do the same thing with food. And I can make a plate, this grilled chicken and um, cauliflower, and I don't know, a couple of other things, but they're all kind of beige. And I'm just like bummed when I look at my plate. It's like, I know there's a lot of nutrition here, but you know, then you added some white asparagus, but it's just all one color. It's not fun. And so the recipe I wanted to share is really easy and it's also beautiful. So I'm going to kind of show you some things. You, you're going to make a little salad dressing and all I do is this is an orange juice and lemon dressing with some olive oil and I just put it in a jar and shake it up and I always make extra because it calls for two tablespoons of orange juice well most oranges have more than two tablespoons so what I just do is I just make up extra dressing and it's wonderful you can use it on any kind of salad and so this is a beet and carrot salad and so all you have to do is you just um shred your beets. Now I use a food processor or you might want to put on a glove. Otherwise you'll dye your hands pink. And you know, if there's anything that you want to be pink in your house, you just uh, shred some beets. As a matter of fact, when I shredded these beets, I took off my white blouse um, to do that. And then the other thing is, is I shred up my carrots. So I just keep these in separate bowls. And so I shred this and I put you know, a couple of tablespoons of my dressing. And then when it's time to plate is, I'm gonna show you the way I did it tonight. And so this is, you can take this and mix it. The thing that happens is the beets will kind of turn the carrots red and you can differentiate the color, but so you can decide, do you wanna serve it side by side or, do you, you know, want to mix it all up? But I thought tonight it was kind of pretty side by side. I have some mint. I live in an apartment and I have a little basket thing that hangs on my balcony and, and I've got herbs in it. So this, I went and pinched some mint leaves off and then my chives are blooming. And so it's always so much fun to me if there's some sort of plants or edible flowers, you know, to take and make this dish. Now it's so simple, it looks gorgeous but to take it to a picnic or a potluck, you know, it's super simple. And the other thing I love to do is when I shred my carrots and beets earlier in the day and put my dressing on them, they kind of marinate and they soak up that yummy, citrusy, nice, fresh flavor. It's also got ginger and the ginger I used today happened to be kind of zingy. Um, ginger is also a great digestive um, to add in. And so it's got fresh herbs, it's got um, ginger, citrus. Um, it's a great spring salad to me. And it always, you know, just feels nice and cool and fresh. Thanks, Linda. And I'm doing a little spontaneous hunger scan in my salivating for <laughs> salad. And how beautiful you made it. My dopamine is definitely flooding my brain. So I have a special recipe, which when you open your email tomorrow, you will see is a casserole. It's like putting everything together. So you have kind of, you know, stick it all in the oven and it all comes out and then you can have some for dinner and then also have some left over for the following day. That really works for us and my family. So I like to use the cost of a pasta and, and just boil that up. But I've been experimenting with a new ingredient, which is ground bison. And 
friend of mine told me about a source for this. It's Force of Nature as a website. And basically you can buy a whole bunch of it, fill your freezer with it, and it's free shipping. And it's called an ancestral blend. And what they do is they actually put organ meats and they mix it together. And there's 3% heart and 7% liver in this bison ancestral blend. And so don't tell your family that there's organ meats in the dinner, because I will tell you that does not bode well for them eating it or eating the leftovers afterwards. So I have learned to keep my mouth shut about some of the nutritional value and those B vitamin sources and liver and iron sources. So basically what I do, and it's all in the recipe for tomorrow, I do something that I learned when I got my Ayurvedic Institute certification in 1995, where I put a bunch of spices together and I kind of list them for you. And I, I just, it could be salt and pepper. It could be ground coriander. It could be, you know, uh, ground mustard. And I, I like to actually cook the spices or the ground spices in oil to kind of bring out the flavors and to activate some of those, uh, the, uh, the uh, healing properties of spices. And, uh, and then I'll, you know, I'll brown the meat and I'll be cooking the pasta over there and I'll be, you know, cubing some sweet potatoes and cooking them up and eventually just mixing it all together, putting it in the oven. If you're feeling adventurous, I actually uh, texted a friend. I said, what is the best vegan cheese? And uh, we had uh, dinner. Um, actually, we got together with friends. We had dinner outside this last weekend, two vegan friends. So if anybody knows what the best vegan cheese is, it's my two vegan friends. They texted me back and they said, Violife, mature cheddar slices they like, or Violife, shredded cheddar. And basically you mix that all in. And after I get the whole casserole together, I like to put arugula in at the end. It's something where it doesn't get overcooked. You can just sort of mix it in and serve or put it right on top of the casserole and put it on the plates. It's just like a little wilted and it's not, you know, kind of overcooked and it doesn't disappear. So uh, that's a recipe that I hope you enjoy tomorrow. I call it my baked bison casserole with Casa pasta and veggies. And uh, thanks so much. You know, I really hope that that you all enjoy and check out the um, the webinar recording when you get it and the email that comes with it. Give these recipes a try. It's always, I think it's a lot of fun to try new things. Now, We'd like to take some questions now. And so if you just go to the Q&A and type your questions in, we've got a few announcements. So we're gonna give some time for you to, um, to type your questions in and um, move, um, move ahead. Okay, let's see. Um, so we'd also like for you in the Q&A, if there are topics, we're, we're making plans for um, a year of webinars. And so we would love to know if there are topics that really interest you. And so be sure and pop those in the Q&A as, as well. And um, that would be a great help to us. We love doing these webinars. We feel like, um, you know, it's a way to give to our community. And it is, um, and it's fun for us to bring information and we love for you to see us and, and how we are as a team. Um, Zoe, I think you're gonna talk about the 20 minute consults. Absolutely. You know, we really wanna serve our community. And one way that we're able to do that is through our 20 minute free consultations where we're able to talk with you, get to know you, hear about your concerns and see if we're a good fit. Uh, Linda and I really enjoyed these 20 minute conversations that we have with uh, patients every week. And it's again, a really good time to see if we are a good mutual fit. Um, you can go online to schedule that uh, through our website at philly-im.com. We also have some cool things on our resource page and we're also present on Instagram and Facebook. So check that out if you'd like. We also have a special gift for you tonight, which is a 10% off coupon as a way to say thank you for coming to the webinar. And you will actually receive this code tomorrow via email. Um, and it will arrive with the recording of this webinar. Now, in order to use this coupon, you do need to schedule a visit in the next week. The visit does not have to actually be in the next week, but it needs to be scheduled in the next week. And it does not apply to visits that are already scheduled. 
So that will be coming to you tomorrow. Linda, did you like to add anything? Yeah, I was going to add, Zoe, that like we said, if you've already got your next visit scheduled and you're like, darn, I want to use that coupon. One thing you can do if you think, well, I've got one scheduled and maybe go three months out from that and go ahead and put it on the schedule. You can put your coupon code in. You can always move that appointment around and, you know, to whatever fits whenever you see any of us the next time. You know, then and and we say, oh, let's make it for three months, and maybe you scheduled it for four months out. We can move that around, and you still get to use that coupon. So don't worry that that you're going to lose your visit or your ten percent discount if you've already got some scheduled. Don't run, go cancel all your appointments and try to redo them. Just put something out there in the future, and uh, and we'll make that uh, work for you. We're also, um, that's why one of the reasons we're interested in hearing about topics you'd like. Our next webinar will be August 10th, Tuesday from 7.30 to nine. And so um, we'd love for you to save the date and be watching our newsletter and our uh, website for the upcoming talk topic. I'd just like to quickly mention and describe that we are a practice that also trains and serves healthcare providers, healthcare workers, integrated professionals as a community. And we've been having a monthly meeting, which has taken place for 74 monthly sessions uh, since, uh, uh, I think, 2015. Uh, so I have created and led these monthly sessions. It's one of my favorite things to do. And so if you are a healthcare worker or you are an integrated professional and you'd like to join for a self-care experience, we don't just talk about it or point to it. We actually dive into it, share it and experience it. This is a Zoom meeting. So this is now available for people all over the country and all over the world. Sometimes we have a practitioner from Hong Kong and sometimes we have people on the West Coast that wake up at five o'clock in the morning to join the 8 a.m. meeting uh, every month. So this is a joy and um, it's uh, something that I'd like to inv invite you to personally if you are a provider. I also just wanna mention that we are accumulating some questions in the q and it's, uh, it's not actually in the chat, it's in the Q&A section at the bottom of the webinar. And we would love to interact with you. We would love questions about our practice. We haven't talk, talked much about uh, specialty testing today. We have any questions about what kind of tests we order. In fact, we might even describe some of those other ways that we serve you so you don't have to wait for a free consult to see some of the ways that we can help. This is also just mentioning that if you are a healthcare provider, we do have a free consultation that can take place with me. We have providers that join us virtually for mentoring uh, over a period of weeks and months. But also I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I take about a maximum of four clinicians that I work one-on-one -on -one with at a time. I currently have four clinicians that are scheduling their one-on-one -on -one visits for me, with me. And uh, we have packages and uh, we like to serve the healthcare community. And that's assisting with the transition to functional medicine. It's knowledge base. It's discussing patient cases. And just yesterday I had a great discussion um, with a, a clinician who wanted to discuss three cases in her uh, uh, her um, one on one uh, clinical mentoring online. So I look forward to seeing you there, and hope that you're if you're if you're interested that you'll explore. Thanks. All right, so we have a few questions that have come in. I'm going to go ahead and field a few of these just to get us started. So the first one um, was just kind of a general topic request. I don't know that we'll, who knows, maybe we'll do a webinar on this, but just more information about gluten-free meals and different gluten-free recipes. Um, I actually just wanted to share a few websites that I really do like for gluten-free recipes. I have been following uh, these for a very long time. So one is Nom Nom Paleo. If you're any part of the paleo community, you've probably made something from her website. She has two cookbooks. They're fantastic. Um, I also really like the Define Dish. She's a little bit newer, but she's got a lot of really great recipes. She does have a section on there that has some gluten in it, like it's recipes for her kids, but just know that most everything else is going to be gluten-free. Those are my probably my top two that I most frequently recommend for gluten-free recipes. So um, I thought I could just give you that resource right off the bat. 
Let's see what else. So we... Caitlin, that was Nom Nom. And the second one was? Yeah, so Nom Nom Paleo. And then the second one is The Defined Dish. Their recipes right. are just delicious. So full of flavor. Wonderful. Um, we can see the, the questions coming in and we invite you to reflect and see how you'd like to interact with us. And, and uh, maybe there's a question sort of on the tip of your tongue or maybe you're typing it in right now and we'll be here to take a look at that. Um, there is a question from E and providers feel free to chime in with me and how to respond to this. It's a question about supplements. So we haven't talked a lot about supplements tonight. We've talked a lot about our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with food, our feelings, sensing our bodies. And this is a question about not like what should we take, it's um, what are some good supplement companies or supplement lines or supplement brands and why we like and choose brands and how we think about supplements as a provider team is actually a wonderful question and we've never had that question before so this will give us a chance to reflect and if someone wants to chime in i do have something to share but does anyone want to chime in there sure i can add to that dr tetlow i think um when we think about supplements uh we need we aim to be as careful as possible and of course to do no harm supplements are not regulated by the fda which means that various supplement companies can sometimes put whatever they'd like to their supplements. And that's not okay with us. We want our patients to have the best of the best, the highest quality. And that's why we choose supplements that are third party tested. There are certain online supplement companies that only sell third party tested supplements, which makes it a little bit easier to sort of field um, the, the supplements that are needed. Um, so uh, I'd also like to add there that at least I've found that there's no one perfect supplement brand, that different brands offer really great supplements. And um, as trained professionals, we can look through the ingredients and we can look to at the label to identify the vitamins and minerals to see what form they're in. There are certain forms of vitamins that are, for example, more absorbable than others. So that is one particular factor that we keep in mind when choosing supplements. Um, would anybody else care to chime in? Well, I think that one thing that you just highlighted is that it's really hard for us to answer that question sometimes because some of the companies that we work with and have been really well vetted and third-party tested may not be available over the counter direct to consumer. So we often are working either directly with the brands to order them for our patients or we're working with an online dispensary that only allows practitioners to get an actual account. If you want access to the best supplements, I definitely recommend establishing care with a practitioner who can provide those for you. That's definitely the most, the, the best way to get the best supplements. If that's not something that's on your radar right now, the next best thing you can do is look for supplements that are third-party tested that may be available at your grocery store. Something like a Whole Foods or a Mom's is more likely to have more third-party testing. They have different markers on them that say that. So like USP and NSF means that they have been third-party tested. But even that being said, that means at some point they were third-party tested. It doesn't mean that they're regularly third-party tested like the online dispensaries that we're referring to. So the, the best option really, I mean, I, I hate to say it, is to establish care with someone who can get you access to those. Um, and then, you know, a backup would be looking for third-party testing that's available over the counter. And I think another thing that's really important is, you know, sometimes... Um, we have patients come up, uh, new patients or 20 minute consult, and, and they just read something on Instagram and decided this might be a good supplement for me. And that's really a, a, an important piece of the testing that we do in working with a practitioner that's doing testing. Um, you don't want to take, for example, a B12 supplement if you have adequate stores of B12. And so these are things that that we are going to test. We do know there are some um, uh, nutrients that people tend to be deficient in, but we don't really just wanna assume that. We wanna test 
And then we want to monitor. Um, when we think about supplements, uh, we're thinking about supporting, hopefully, until food can come on board so that our absorption is good. And so there are a lot of things that go into, um, into choosing those supplements and thinking about why would a particular supplement be the best or the right one for any individual. I love what you said there, Linda, because I, I would wholeheartedly agree that supplements should supplement the food that you're not eating. But we like a food first approach and that ties in beautifully with with Kate, what Caitlin has shared with us tonight. So um, I, I would agree with your, with your thoughts. And another reason we like a food first approach is because it's really important to keep costs low with supplements. You know, the supplement monthly bill can really add up and it's important to make care affordable. If we can't afford to come in or we can't afford to be on a particular program, it doesn't matter how good it is. So one thing we do as a provider team is we kind of scavenge all our online dispensary to see where the deals are. Sometimes there will be supplements that are combination supplements. I just looked today at um, a supplement that's a combination supplement for someone who needs to manage their blood sugar. And so in one supplement, you're going to have some of the minerals that are helping insulin work well so that the blood sugar is going out, that the sugar in the blood is going out of the blood and into the cells. So there's mineral content, including vanadium, which is unusual. There's things like gymnema um, and, and bitter melon. There's different, different you know, specialty. You don't actually have to have a separate supplement for those particular items. Alpha lipoic acid is something that sometimes people need to take separately, but it's included in that combination supplement. It's a good value. I mean, another way to think about good value is, you know, sometimes we'll think about riboflavin. Riboflavin is vitamin B2. So if someone has migraines, we'll sometimes do testing and see whether or not they have a vitamin B2 deficiency or a magnesium deficiency. And there is a particular supplement that has quite a bit of riboflavin in a single capsule. So you don't have to take four of them. You can just take one. So less capsules, lower cost, and we'll have wonderful probiotics, but sometimes the probiotic is expensive. So as a team, we figured out you can give one eighth of a packet to a patient for a dose. So that can really control an expensive probiotic cost because we're finding a high dose of a probiotic, but then dosing in a very small amount over time to really save money. Because we know that this needs to be affordable and needs to be sustainable in terms of practices in cooking, in terms of how, you know all of the lifestyle changes that we're, we're encouraging and inviting in our patients, the, the program, the, the plan needs to be doable and it needs to be doable for the pocketbook. So that's very important. I'd love to transition and talk a little bit about testing, and I'd love to open it up to the whole provider team about that. Uh, we have a very transparent website, and we welcome you to visit that. Uh, there is actually a part of the website that describes testing and testing costs, testing information. And one thing that we like to do is to research tests that are the best, but also the least expensive. So we're thinking about mold specialty testing or mycotoxin or Lyme and co-infection specialty testing. We research and sometimes upgrade our tests every six months or more often to find the ones that are the most accurate but also the least expensive. And we also use um, different labs for people who do not have insurance to get insurance for reimbursed lab core or quest testing. So we have a whole menu uh, that we use through Cleveland Heart Lab so that we can price and reduce costs so someone doesn't have to go into a lab core or quest and sort of wait for a bill but they can choose and have an upfront and understanding of how much things cost and they can actually see what they're comfortable with and what they can afford. So we use Cleveland Heart Labs for that specialty hand-picked testing. We also have a variety of SIBO tests that we have on board that we're developing and evolving and we hope to talk to you about that soon. There are some new evolving SIBO test options that are exciting and what we try to do is make sure that they're uh, that all the tests that we bring on are accurate before we bring them on. So we sometimes will compare two different tests against each other and we'll make sure that the, the testing is actually uh, accurate before we commit and, and invite our patients to participate. We have combination tests that look at vitamins and detox and dysbiosis all at the same time. Sometimes those are blood urine combinations. We have saliva testing for genetics for standalone genetics appointments. And we also have a wonderful metabolite testing for, for hormones. Sometimes we don't, we're not able to get through LabCorp and Quest, the whole symphony of what are the metabolites 
for different estrogens that are involved and how the body's breaking down and detoxifying or transforming different hormones. And sometimes if you don't see those pathways or see what's happening in particular in a particular patient, you can't personalize their program or understanding why is hair falling out? What, why is my bone density like this? Why do I have these symptoms on a monthly basis related to my menstrual cycle? Um, and, and, and other factors that really relate to hormone and successful um, low symptom menopause transition. So we, we really don't want these hormonal tr transitions to be painful. We want them to be supported and we wanna support you. We have a lot of detox testing as well. And we're very careful about uh, food sensitivity. We don't wanna order a food sensitivity test that tells you, you know, no, 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 because then um, it's, it's giving a message that the food is a problem and that you have to think a lot when you're eating. So we wanna really choose the timing for uh, especially uh, tests that indicate a negative relationship with food or food restriction, but we do use those tests when they're needed and uh, in the right context. And we're quite careful about that. So I think Caitlin, there's this great question. Oh, maybe you already answered it about um, the two, one teenager that eats meat and one teenager that eats is vegetarian. I thought that was a great question. Yeah, I typed a quick little response in there, but I think I could go ahead and answer it for everyone because I, I think many people deal with different dietary preferences in the home, selective eating habits, picky eating, things like that. Really depends on the situation. I, I might need a little more information to give a really good detailed response, but you know, we have to remember about personalities at different ages. And, and one of the things that I try to remind parents is that sometimes selective eating is a form of rebellion. And it's just one of the things that you have control over. So maybe you just don't want to be, you know, you're told all day by your teachers what to do. You're told all afternoon by your coaches what to do. You're told all evening by your parents what to do. And at any age in from childhood through adolescence, we sometimes just want to have our own sort of agency and our own power and control. And one of the things that we tend to get control over is our food. If we say, oh, I'm a vegetarian, then, you know, parents are going to maybe show up and, and, and listen to that. So I'm not saying that that's this particular person's situation, but, you know, I really got started with pediatric nutrition and that's one of the biggest things that I, that I really learned and took away from that is the more that you try to control your children's food habits, the more they're going to resist. And so trying to kind of like take the pressure off and say, all right, great. You're a vegetarian. Cook yourself a cook, cook some dinner for the family. We'd love to have your vegetarian food. You, you want to eat meat? Awesome. Go to the grocery store, see how much it costs, buy it yourself, right? You know, kind of giving them a broader context of the situation so that they can, maybe they make the meal together. Maybe, maybe they find a way to make something that works for everyone, um, you know, within foods that they're willing to enjoy. You know, as we get to those teen years and as adolescents, we're really going to want to encourage that independence with food. And, um, sometimes I'll have, I'll have patients who really, they just, they just need to start somewhere. And maybe that's just baking muffins. And that's what they do on the weekends. They start by baking muffins and then they start by baking muffins with carrots in them. Right. You know, and then they start eating carrots in their dinner, whatever it may be, just kind of having their own, their own control and their power can sometimes be really helpful. So we think one of the greatest oh, go right ahead, Linda. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I think one of the greatest things that we can do is teach our kids to cook, to teach others to cook and to support people as they're learning to cook. It, it can be really, really simple and really easy and really quick, but making our own food is, is um, a way to, to just have, have gifts and share gifts. Thank you. So I'm gonna get ready to uh, wind up our evening and I'm just gonna look for a thumbs up for my fellow providers, just that this is a good time for us to do that, fantastic. And uh, we also want to acknowledge that someone has also shared in the question and answer a potential topic for an upcoming talk. So we, we see your message and we appreciate that. And you know, sleep is a really important area and it's actually something that we talk about in almost every appointment. And we call it sleep hygiene, which means how we approach it and what are our lifestyle practices? How do we invite it? How do we know if we're sleeping enough? And some of those are body cues and some of those are other ways. Sometimes we'll do cortisol testing to actually look into 
what is the cortisol level when we wake up? What is it when it's throughout the day and also as we're um, getting ready to go to sleep? We want to really appreciate the time you've taken to, to join us tonight. I want to say thank you so much to our presenters tonight. And I want to say thank you to Caitlin. Thank you for the energy and the enthusiasm, the expertise, and also the caring and the heart that you've put into this presentation. And it really is a gift. Uh, the presence of all of my providers and also of Nicole facilitating us. Each of the provider team and Nicole have completed a full day of patient care. We gathered a, about an hour before the presentation to coordinate together, meet together, um, and support each other. And it's been a, quite a day. It's a, something that we really enjoy doing. It's our pleasure. And you've also had a long day. So we're gonna get ready to send you off with warm wishes for a pleasant night. If you've received something from this webinar, we hope that you can put it into action for yourself. We hope that it can help to cultivate a nurturing, kind relationship with yourself and that you can notice those times when judgment or those moralistic, there's a lot of ways we talk to ourselves, which can be less than kind. So we hope that this has brought more kindness and health to you, more awareness to you. And don't forget about your hunger scan. You can think about your mood. You can think about your energy level. You can think about the sensations in your body, just a quick check-in. And thank you so much for attending tonight. We want to wish you well. And please join us on August 10th. That's a Tuesday at 7.30 for our next talk. Mark it on your calendar, and we'll be giving you more information soon. If you're not on our newsletter, please sign up. And thank you so much for joining us. Take care. <laughs>